open stand when he's with me. My, my start? Yep. Okay. Uh, we'll call this uh, meeting to order is 10 a.m. on this June the 5th. And uh, hope everyone's joining us and we will uh, have the opening ceremonies. So is that the uh, members of think roll number? The roll call? call? Yeah. Do the roll number, please. That's it. Deputy Mayor Windover, are you present? Present. Councillor Armstrong? Present. Councillor Franzen? Present. Um, Mayor Clarkson, we're hoping will join us electronically, but she's not present right now. And Councillor Lamsett has sent his regrets. For staff, we have Donna Taggart, CIO Treasurer. Present. Dan Ruth, Deputy Clerk. Present. Bianca Dragisevic, Temporary Records Management Coordinator. Present. And Jesse Clark, Director of Corporate Services. Clerk is present. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a disclosure of any pecuniary interest. Suing them, we can uh, declare pecuniary interest at any time it comes to that moment. Uh, so we have a approval of the agenda. I'll move it. Motion approved. Peter and Carol, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Deputy Mayor Windover, we can just call for the vote. Oh, just call the vote, yes. Carried, yes. So, Donna, tell you the staff reports, staff presentation. Donna? Thank you, through you. I wanted to welcome everybody today to the annual Ratepayers and Cottage Association meeting. I also wanted to take the time to thank the staff that were involved in the creation of this document. I really appreciate it. Kathy is our newest finance member. She actually prepared the PowerPoint for us. Chelsea and Jesse were uh, very much involved uh, in editing and, and preparing the content. And I also wanted to thank Anne and Bianca today for attending uh, because they're behind the scenes and, and helping us to, to help this, this meeting carry on. So. And just taking the time to thank council and all of staff in the municipality, just the uh, last year has been difficult. And virtually overnight, we were called to uh, uh, start meetings electronically and, and create business plans and, and working from home plans. So I really appreciate all the work and council's been very supportive of that. So thank you. And the public as well. We've had lots of great feedback from the public. So. I also wanted to let everyone know that today we're going to try something new, thanks to our clerk. We're going to try some interactive polling questions and we hope that you're able to contribute to that. So we'll start with the first slide, please. So the municipality provides services through various departments and those are listed there for you. They include administration, emergency services, public works, the recreation and facilities, waste management, water, and building and planning. Just to further elaborate on those departments, under administration, there are um, several departments, the finance, corporate services, economic development, recreation and community, 911, there are outdoor rinks, beaches, community halls, parks, boat launches, the public works involves three depots, about 300 kilometers of roads, uh, seven meters of bridges um, and waste management for transfer stations, the haulage, emergency services. We have four fire stations, about 54 staff that are considered volunteers uh, that fight fires for us and attend scenes, building and planning, uh, land use planning, the OPP services, bylaw enforcement, animal control, and we do have two user pay water systems with 316 users on there, and two library branches, the tourist booth, two health centers, and the policing, there's a community policing branch in um, Cavendish, and uh, the heritage site that is the heritage office is located in the Galway Community Center. So, Jesse, I think we'll try our first question. That's okay. 
So our first question is, do you follow the municipality of Trent Lakes on social media? If you can take a moment to answer. We're good. So it looks like many of you um, are following us on Facebook. So that's good, but we wanted to, to let you know that you can and stay, in, stay informed all year round. And we share important information through our social media web portals. There's information on recycling tips and events, notices of construction, and just ways to get involved and support the community. So that's great. Thanks, Jesse. So the agenda today, we tried to include items that were requested from the associations, and that includes some discussions on the budget, some cost-saving measures, waste management, the capital project for 2021, some COVID-19 pressures, just upcoming events and new changes, and how to stay informed all year round. So our first slide is on the municipal budget. You will see actually that the municipal budget decreased by 1.6 million for 2021. And that is largely due to the fact that the Beaver Lake Road uh, project was completed. And, and we're hearing very good things about that project, which was largely funded through a grant, gas tax money, some reserves and taxation. The municipal budget is apportioned, not surprisingly, the largest portions are public works and the capital, and the smallest, the recreation and facilities department. The total dollars to be collected uh, for 2021 is just over 23 million. And you will see the breakdown. Uh, it's broken down between the lower tier, the upper tier as the county and the school boards for education which out of every dollar, 44 cents stays at the lower tier, 38 cents to the county and 18 cents for education. So I think we'll do another poll question, Jesse, please. So did you know that the County of Peterborough's tax portion is based on the assessment base? Yes or no? like most oh they didn't okay they were not aware that's that's interesting so yes Trent Lakes pays the second largest portion of uh, the levy to the county with someone being the largest so for uh, 2021 the average based on a hundred thousand dollars worth of assessment there would be a nine dollar and seventy cent increase and interestingly enough, $7.20 of that is because of the county actually, uh, and $2.50 would be Trent Lakes and the education rate remain the same as in 2020. The impact to the average homeowner is about $54.74 and that is based on the assessment for 2021 which is $401,045.60. That's the average assessed value. And, and just as a reminder, there was no reassessment that was supposed to take place last year, but it did not because of COVID-19. So the, we are all using the same assessment as we did in 2020, largely, unless there was improvements to the property. Our next slide just speaks to some cost savings that were included for the 2021 budget. The municipality did purchase their own mask fit test machine. Uh, this has resulted in reduced emergency services staff hours and fuel vehicle maintenance and travel time. And we're able, as we are able to do that uh, fit test on site now. And we did use some safe restart grant money that the province provided us to, to purchase that. So we did also defer replacing some fire department boats, some support trailers, 
And we did uh, lower our cost per meter square for surface treatment based on the cost that it actually it just benchmark and continued digitization and efficiency processes. So the next slide uh, speaks to waste and really just shows that uh, the waste is different every year, dep depending on the habits of residents and families have largely, there has been an increase in household waste because families have really been at home and therefore are potentially creating more weekly garbage and blue box material. And there's um, just seasonal residents that have arrived are, are back and are staying longer than normal or actually didn't leave in some circumstances. So. The recycling um, has some fluctuations for fibers and containers. Uh, residents, um, the fluctuations are once again related to residents being at home, seasonal residents arriving back and staying longer than normal. Just overall blue box material tonages uh, continue to decrease due to lightweight materials, thinner plastics and cans, and packaging choices of uh, companies are changing from glass to plastic pouches, for instance, and just the overall volume of material continues to increase as consumers demand to be able to purchase items in larger quantities in one single purchase. So I think we'll do another poll question. So we're wondering if, have you ever used our searchable waste and recycling app on our website? So many have not. So just, just to let you know, you can search items and determine where they go and also set reminders about changes to hours of operation, upcoming events and unplanned site closures. So the diversion rates, um, many diversion materials were unable to be collected in 2020 due to the pandemic, such as textiles, reuse centers, the household hazardous waste, the garbage did increase, therefore it's likely to see a decrease in our diversion rate for 2020. And the 2020 waste management report is expected in July from the county and it will confirm the 2020 diversion rate. So waste haulage costs uh, were up and we have increased the budget for that in 2021 and that is largely due to the increase in the trends because of COVID-19 and there were some changes with the waste card, eliminating quarterly restrictions and issuing of replacement waste cards. So it, this could impact waste tonnages and therefore haulage. So the 2021 Capital Row projects include Fulton Lane, John Street, Main Street, William Street, and we are doing major reconstruction on the Mystic Point Road. So we'll do another poll question. Please, Jesse. And ask, have you subscribed to any of our website pages or calendars? Looks like about half of you have, that's good. So yes, stay in touch year round by subscribing to any of our website pages, including the calendars and the news. And we do have a new website, which hopefully most of you have seen by now, but uh, we're getting very good feedback on that site. So. so the capital spending, there was a, a 10 year facility replacement plan approved in 2020. And that included the beginning preliminary stages of a dedicated mechanics facility. So we have currently have some preliminary design work done. And to the next steps right now, council has directed that uh, we look at in shared space to include the recreation and facilities department in that location as well. 
So that is currently happening. And then there'll be more detailed design and engineering happening after that. So we are purchasing a new tandem truck and a new pumper truck in 2021. And just to let you know, we did just receive or the 2020 vehicles, they are late in coming because of, of COVID as well. So there is an addition to the Cavendish Dome going to happen this year as well. And quite a bit of work at the Odening Park. So, so far there has been some paving done at the parking lot there. We have applied for a grant for some new playground equipment and there'll be a gazebo and a new garden, just to name a few and some new chairs. So lots of work happening there. So the impacts of COVID-19, really it's just been uncertain financial impacts to the municipality and the grant assistant or, or assistance or future grant assistance from the province or federal government. We have certainly seen an increase in the fire department calls, an increase in the materials brought to the transfer stations, an increased need for volunteer fire recruitment, which of course costs money and needs uh, to adapt training for those individuals electronic meetings and recording requirements. Uh, we have seen some increased tax arrears off and on and council did waive penalty for April, May and June of last year, which was well received. Increased costs for PPE, cleaning and equipment and just continued changes in office processes to adapt to the COVID-19 restrictions. These are just some of the upcoming events. The Environment Day, unfortunately, on June 2nd was suspended, but the mattress collection is going ahead at the Buckhorn Transfer Station on June 2nd, 3rd, 5th, and 6th at $20 an item. And there'll be a new mattress collection at the Bob Cajun Transfer Station September 24th, 25th, and 26th at $20 as well. There'll be a mobile household hazardous waste event at the Cavendish Community Center July the 10th from 9 to 1. And just, we've had a new change to our building and planning department. We did implement a new uh, cloud permit software system, which is very has been very well received and includes uh, the ability to submit, track and pay for permits online, upload all required documents and schedule building inspections through this new portal. And we are looking, there is a planning one apparently coming out in the summer. So we'll be looking at that one as well, as soon as we're able. So our next poll question, please, Jesse. Is, did you know that council meetings are recorded and available on YouTube? Most of you did, that's good. So if you if you didn't know, you are able, if you miss a council meeting to watch it at any time, and it's available through our website and also the council minutes and agendas are also available. So just some information regarding a new compost facility at the city of Peterborough. The city of Peterborough received a sizable grant last year to build and operate a new composting facility. It's to be built at the current landfill site on Bensford Road and will utilize the most effective gore composting system for our Canadian climate. The city is in the process of attaining all the necessary permit, zoning changes and environmental assessments. It's to be operational by 2023 and the county has been working very closely with the city in order to utilize this facility for future organic initiatives. So uh, the county will be working with a consultant to determine the most effective and efficient organic program for the county. And there'll be public consultation as part of that process. So the next is staying informed all year round. So this is just more information. If you hit the stay in touch, on our website, you can find out news about burn bans, economic development, COVID-19, garbage recycling, any emergency alerts, community events, municipal events, and the, the council calendar. So I believe we just have one more poll question. 
Would you like to see online surveys created for you to share your comments on service enhancements and future programs? Well, that's great. 93% would like to see that. So that's really good information because it is important certainly to engage staff or engage the residents in decisions that are being made. So that's that's really good news. So um, I think I'll just take a couple of minutes. I don't want to speak too much longer here, but we did have a couple of questions after uh, we wanted to address today. So there was a question related to extending the CIP beyond Buckhorn. And the, there is a plan to have a routine review of the CIP, but it is not looking at expanding it out of the area of Buckhorn at this time. There was uh, a request to update the short-term rental situation, and that has been deferred until September. The 49 depot refurbishment, that's pending the space needs study for the Recreation and Facilities Department. So there'll be some decisions to be made about that facility, whether that uh, department can actually relocate there or there needs to be money spent at that if we're going to continue to use it. So just a little bit about the septic inspection program, only that I just wanted to let you know the Cavendish area is the one being um, inspected this year. And there was a question that about the transfer station site and the, and the hour change, and that item has been deferred until September as well. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donna. It was very good. Thanks now, delegations. And uh, our first delegation is from Ed Hocus Lear. Uh, representing Court of the Lakes Steward Association. Please unmute your auto and or share your camera and make your delegation. You will have 10 minutes and I will ask counsel that all questions are saved until the end of the delegation. Okay, thank you. Good morning, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, good morning. Thank you, Deputy Mayor and Councillors, for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Ed Leardam. I am the current chair of the Corth Lake Stewards Association. And I just wanted to share some of the things that we are uh, up to this year. Um, and if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So what is the Corth Lake Stewards Association and what do they do? Um, the Corth Lake Sewerage Association is a volunteer, nonprofit organization of community scientists made up of cottagers, year round residents, and local businesses formed to monitor the water quality of the Corth Lakes, to educate the public, and to conduct research in new areas of public concern with strong links to governments, academic institutions, conservation authorities, and many local organizations. KLSA celebrated its 20th anniversary in 2020. Next slide, please. This is our current board of directors. Oh, there my video went on. Um, there's our current board of directors. Um, you'll see quite a variety of, of individuals uh, representing uh, uh, some of the uh, retired folks that we have uh, in the area. Um, some are residents, some are cottagers. Uh, we have uh, a representation from Corth the Conservation, uh, from the Township of Selwyn, um, and, uh, and a few other individuals, uh, uh, one from Ontario Tech U as well. Next slide, please. This is a list of all of our wonderful volunteers um, who participate actively in all of our water collection activities for testing, um, as well as our other projects that we have ongoing and we'll, we'll have this year, um, covered uh, um, by about 60 of, or more than 60 volunteers on all these lakes, um, both inside the, the municipality of Trent Lakes and outside, because our geography stretches from pretty well Balsam Lake through to, uh, to Peterborough. 
Thank you. Next slide, please. We can't operate alone and also with just volunteers. So we have committees of people who help us as well as advisors. Um, since we're a community science organization uh, involved in, um, you know, counts of bacteria and E. coli uh, uh, and other, uh, other science-y things, I'm gonna call it. Um, we have a, a board of scientific advisors and uh, made up of these four people. Um, we also should make note or mention of Dr. Andrea Kirkwood of Ontario Tech U, who we uh, consistently consult with, um, but hasn't been officially put on our, our scientific advisory board yet. Um, we have our community outreach group uh, on our board. Thank you. And uh, fundraising, of course, is important for us since we rely solely on donations and grants. And um, we have, uh, of course, our annual report, Lake Water Quality Report, just published uh, for the year 2020. Um, and we have a, an editorial committee made up of these folks here on our board and, and outside of our board uh, who do a terrific job and would like to thank them as well. Next slide, please. We have a few ongoing annual projects. Um, and the most important one, the reason why it was formed 20 years ago uh, was to test for E. coli in our Kawartha Lakes. Um, that's an ongoing annual project and many of our volunteers, that's where we get the bulk of our volunteers to take samples uh, six times through June through September and uh, take them to the lab in, in uh, Lakefield for testing. Um, we participate in the uh, Lake Partner Program for phosphorus testing. Many of our volunteers do that as well. We do report on that for the Kawartha region uh, in our annual report. Um, some new projects that we have this year, and um, uh, some started even last year. Um, one of the big issues that we have constantly is uh, invasive species in our waters, uh, different aquatic invasive species. Um, and um, the newest and biggest one uh, uh, growing rapidly is starry stonework. So we have a project going on this year where we are looking to identify where starry stonewort is present, how much it's growing and spreading, and um, logging that into uh, some applications where uh, that information can be looked at and hopefully some measures can be taken to uh, control the spread of starry stonewort. We have a multi-year project started uh, piloted last year and starting officially this year uh, for um, monitoring the lake water temperature on an ongoing basis and dissolved oxygen monitoring. And why is those, uh, that important? Well, it's related to climate change. Um, as, as we get warmer and warmer, and we know that's happening, um, the waters also uh, get warmer um, and that affects everything that's under the surface of the water, the, the aquatic plants, all the fish, all the microorganisms, everything that grows underwater, they're susceptible to, to any um, temperature changes in the lake water. And um, we can, uh, using that data, uh, pretty well predict in so many years uh, that you know certain species of fish might disappear in our lakes because it's getting too warm. The colder fish, uh, colder water fish, uh, won't be able to, to handle that. And the same with aquatic species. So. This is an important project for, um, for looking at what climate change um, effects there are, are going to be in our lakes. Good morning, Ma Madam Mayor, thank you. Um, another project we have underway um, is our Natural Edge program. Um, this is in partnership with Watersheds Canada. Um, it's again, a new project that we're undertaking uh, in 2021. We will um, re-landscape, if you will, plant natural uh, uh, plants and shrubs um, on 10 shoreline properties. Um, They're private properties, uh, and this is all done in conjunction with the uh, property owners. Uh, uh, an assessment is done, a visit, a plan is made, agreed to by the property owner. Um, there's a, a $250 grant from Watersheds Canada per property, and the property owner uh, matches that 
So they get $500 worth of plants on their property and we assist in planting those. In fact, we did the first five this past weekend. Uh, three were done on um, um, Stony uh, Lovesick Lake and two are on Big Cedar Lake. Um, so we will do another five this fall. Um, next slide, please. Um, and as mentioned, we have just recently published our annual lake quality, water quality report. Um, I did drop off a, a bundle of 25 at the uh, the um, Trent Lakes Municipal Building in Nogi's Creek. Um, and, uh, and I hope you're able to grab them and read them. Uh, it is our 20th anniversary uh, publication, a uh, very special edition. We're very proud of it. It's a really, really good informative um, uh, report this year. Um, if you want any information, you want reports mailed to you uh, for, or for anything to do with us, um, you can email us at uh, this email address. Our website there, of course, is there for all our reports going back 20 years, plus any other information that we have with respect to meetings and, and things like that. Um, you can also find us on Facebook. Um, and next slide, please. So I added some slides with more detail on the projects. Um, I don't want to take up more time than I'm allotted. Um, but uh, you're, I'm happy to go through these if you wish, if I get a show of hands or, or you can see them at your leisure um, and I can take any questions if you have any. Uh, Ron, what, <clears throat> what is the time? At 10 this minutes point? is right over there. Yeah, so is, where are we in the 10, 10 minutes? minutes? 10 nine minutes, minutes. Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. nine minutes? Yeah. Okay, I, I think, um, thanks, very, thanks very much, Ron. I thought I could do this from home and I couldn't connect. Uh, I think your 10 minutes is pretty well up, so let's use the rest of the time for uh, questions. Yes, Phil. Yeah, and thank you to you, Madam Mayor. Um, and thank you very much. I wanna thank you and your organization for all the very important work that you do do, and obviously you do a great deal of work. Um, our lakes are one of the assets we have in this municipality, both economically and for quality of life. Uh, and, and I'd like to thank all the other associations, ratepayers and cottage associations that voluntarily do this testing and monitoring uh, because it's very important to stay on top of it. I do have a question. <laughs> the question is, uh, what about Eurasian milfoil? That was a, a big issue uh, as an invasive species, I want to say two or three years ago, maybe five. Um, I'm just wondering what the status of that in terms of uh, growth, um, mitigation, et cetera. If you could share some insight on that. Thank you, Dan, sir. Um, yes, we're very aware of the Eurasian milfoil issue. Um, we are getting many requests from individuals with cottages and residents um, on various lakes um, stretching across the Kawarthas. Um, we are not actively looking for that at the moment. Um, it's It's a bit of a I'm going to say uh, uh, um, older invasive species. It's been around longer than starry stonework. Um, and um, although it is still a problem, um, it doesn't spread as fast as starry stonework. And starry stonework appears to be um, more of, of, of a problem to, um, to get rid of. To, to, you can't boat through it. You can't swim through it. It's a mass of weeds. Um, and um, so we're fo focusing on that. The way that, that this program is going to work is that it's basically called a rake toss. So you throw a rake into a patch of weeds near a marina or, or somewhere where there's, uh, a, you know, you can see a patch of weeds. Um, you drag it in and you sort it and see what, what you can find. Um, Eurasian milfoil can certainly be identified along with the starry stonework. Um, so, so we're not actively looking for it at the moment, um, but it can be a part of what we find when we're looking for the starry stoneward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Councillor Franson? Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I'd like to thank you uh, for all the work you do as well. Um, I have a question about the fish. It, is there any talk about introducing other species of fish, if uh, uh, let's say the trout can't survive it, uh, because of the, our cold wa water lake becoming warmer? I, I was just wondering if I, you had any information on that. 
Sorry, you we were, I couldn't hear your last part. No, I was just wondering if you had any further information on that. No, I don't. Uh, I've not uh, heard of any plans um, for for replacing species of fish that might um, disappear with a warmer water. Um, I would probably point you to uh, MNRF for that kind of information. They, they're of course the fisheries management uh, organization uh, and ministry. So, so if there are any plans, I'm not aware of them, but. Um, they may have something that they're thinking of. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have a I have a question for you, Ed. And again, you know, thank you. I know you guys have worked hard long before it was uh, it was socially uh, the thing to do. Uh, my concern right now is the uh, the uh, the addition of rice to buckhorn pigeon um, in the, the lakes that are surrounding Curve Lake because they are absolutely choking. And with that is not only the rice problem, but as that takes place, it causes the water to warm. The water, the, war the warmer the water gets, the more the weeds grow. Right now, my husband cleaned the beach yesterday. He took off two pails of dead fish, small ones, little bass. We've never had a bass kill in Buckhorn Lake. So the, uh, the rice is a, is a huge problem. People are just, they're chopping away to try to get to a channel as you, as you well know. So we've got to get some awareness to this and uh, and realize that you know it was native at one time, but right now it's become an invasive species. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I really don't know how to reply to that. Um, the issue of the menomen or the wild rice um, is, as you as you mentioned, it's it's um, it's interesting that you call it an invasive species. It's it's. I know it's being um, uh, planted and harvested uh, by by those who are interested in in, in harvesting and using the wild rice. Um, um, I'm not sure that it's classified as an invasive species um, since it is a native species and has been. Um, and and we are an organization that looks at um, sort of sort of what shouldn't be there and 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 there's a debate on whether wild rice should be or not should be should not be there which i don't think we wanted to get into and as an organization um as far as um uh the fish kills i mean i've heard of them over the years in many places many different species of fish and um obviously there's there's a reason why fish kills are happening um many of them uh we don't know why um um and and uh, a link to to wild rice is something I'm not aware of as well. Um, and um, I will take that back to our our science advisory board and our, our scientists uh, and and mention that to them and see if they have any any response to that. And I can get back to you on that, Madam Mayor. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Window. Yes, I just like to thank you too, Ed, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, is thank everybody you. fine? Okay, we appreciate your uh, your taking the time, and uh, we will move on. And I want to thank you before we go uh, for your support. Um, you support us uh, uh, financially, and uh, we appreciate that very much. It allows us to produce these reports and to educate the public. Thank you. Okay, our next delegation is going to be from Gary Giroux. And again, 10 minutes, please, and then uh, hold your questions to the end of the presentation. Welcome, Gary. I know you're there somewhere. Maybe you've got the same problem I had. Sorry, I'm mm -hmm. hearing you, Mayor Clark. The actual next, the next person that's on, it was Christine? on the agenda is Christine. I'm sorry. Christine, I jumped right over you. Where are you? I am right here. Okay, go ahead, please. Okay. Can you hear me? We've got uh, internet issues here as well, so I'm I'm using uh, metered internet this morning. So hopefully, uh, my connection stay, stays well. Um, I uh, have put together a little uh, presentation material on behalf of today's meeting. You could go forward, Jesse, please. 
Um, first, I want to thank you for uh, staff and uh, council for taking the time for today. I do know that there is a huge work effort, um, but I also see that there's a, a, a very, very significant benefit for being able to take the time to share the information in a, a two-way dialogue. I am uh, Christine Brickman. I'm the Vice President of the Crystal Lake Community Association, and um, I was uh, nominated by our executive to come forward to uh, share with you some of the um, items that we think are important for our community, as well as some of, I thought I'd take the time to share with you some of the initiatives that we have on the go as well. Um, I wanted to make a request to Trent Lakes, as, um, as we we're seeing here a a lot of items that are big on the topic in the past year, and I'm certain there's more to come, that we could possibly uh, see a way to have um, information communicated with the ratepayers and the associations in advance. And maybe that's already available and I'm just not aware of it, but there are certain topics like the short-term rentals, the, the uh, transfer station changes for Sunday night hours. If um, So what we're asking is that we could, that the staff could seek input and or involvement. Um, we think that that would be integral and be very assistive and helpful with council in their decisions. And as we see it, we are you. You know, we're the right payers, we are the voice, we have the vibe of the community and we are also very uh, connected. And if we're not connected, we can quickly connect. And that way we're not chasing the information and trying to catch up after the fact as we have on a few of the topics as of late. Uh, we do have a very active executive and a board and we're actually having our uh, AGM next week and we are able to easily tap into a very large skill set um, with our the people that are on the executive and the board and with that diversity we can provide um, uh, a lot of skills and capability quickly and we think would be, as I said, would, could be assistive and provide some feedback. Next, Jesse. Uh, one of the ways that that could be done as it used to be done and maybe uh, there's a list that, that um, I can get on, but we used to have it distributed via email when there was topics that were coming up that would be um, obviously of interest to area residents or waterfront uh, it used to be posted as a bulletin on on the trent lakes website and perhaps now with social media when you saw i think that was a 78 percent people follow trent lakes on facebook and or twitter that's huge so there you've got a um, you know websites are handy for certain types of communication but social media really is the way uh for easier communication in, in this day. Um, I see it as an overall positive to be to seek input and involve the right payers. I mean, we may not always um, perhaps understand the background on a certain item and why it's being brought forward for change, and which is why it's good to involve so that we can see your side, we can see your side, and perhaps we could come up with a, a compromised or a balanced um, change that would be, would fit all. Um, as we all know, when it came up uh, often in your presentation, Donna, the COVID has changed everything and the lines are really quite blurred now between what is a permanent and a seasonal resident. Um, we've had a lot of what would have been seasonals or weekenders have now really uh, swung the other way and they spend more time here than they did in the past and they're enjoying it and finding it, uh, it has been actually a very easy transition for them to switch to having uh, internet access here and they're finding um, that, they, that they're investing more money and more time in their, in their residence here. Another thing of note is that we have adopted the use of residence and waterfront and community we've essentially dropped the term cottager. And I do see for Gary Jerosis, he's also switched to community. So the use of cottager is really an older term. And we see that it, it has created a, a division or it, or it labels certain people when there isn't really uh, anybody, people just don't identify now to being a cottager. It may be my cottage, 
but I'm not a cottager per se. We feel that it's more inclusive to use the word community or residence. Next, please, Jesse. Some of the important topics that we have on go right now is the short-term rentals. Um, we have created a guidelines and an etiquette brochure. It's in the final, final um, review phase, and we will be sharing it with you once it has been properly vetted. But we think that this will be an excellent approach to have this shared out, not only with Crystal Lake and area, but also throughout the municipality. It's very user friendly. It's been, uh, we put a lot, a lot of thought in. We pulled and vetted information from a smaller group of about 25 uh, residents around the, the lake to get their input on it. So we think that this will be a friendlier approach to share out uh, guidelines and an etiquette brochure as a first start, as opposed to going to the restricted licensing bylaw. The transfer lake, sorry, the uh, transfer site Sunday hours. We also think that that's a very important topic, and we were glad to see that that has been de deferred until September. If there's any additional um, input that is required, and again, we can easily get information out to our our community and ask them what their thoughts are. I do know that there is uh, some concerns around um, uh, the numbers of hours that need to be worked per week per day and I think that there's a possibility that we can get around that and make it um, more workable for everybody. We also are requesting again that uh, hardtop be put in the budget for East Clear Bay. Um, that's been a topic that's been on my hit list for um, probably 10 years now and um, uh, Donna, at, at some point, perhaps you could um, put on your, your list to uh, follow up on that with us around budgeting for the East Clear Bay. Um, another very hot topic right now, no pun intended, but we've already seen four fires around Crystal Lake in 2021. And um, the re recent one this week, I'm not sure if you heard about it, but it was caught very quickly by residents across the way. The fire happened on a stretch of land that there's no road access to. And it had it not been for the very, very quick action and the of a couple of the residents that spotted the fire thought it looked a little unusual. It turned out that we were having a CLCA executive Zoom meeting at the time when the notification came through our very active Facebook group site. And it um, put into gear a huge teamwork of people. They were able to put the fire out. The mayor? Just one minute. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, uh, please proceed. So on the the, the uh, fire department, though, we are asking, uh, we are going to be asking and seeking the um, uh, some portable pumps to help us to be able to try and put the fires out while we're waiting for the uh, firefighters in some instances. Um, some initiatives we have on the go, we've got a, uh, a novelty oversized chair that's coming, book exchange library, we're also updating our Crystal Lake map with new fire route numbers and 911 numbers. Uh, we're having our June our uh, AGM this Wednesday, as I mentioned, and we have a very uh, large and growing Facebook presence and website presence. Next, please. Um, also wanted to mention who our partners are. We're with uh, we we pay dues to FOCA, the uh, Coalition of Equitable Water uh, Lake. Kawartha Lake Stewards Association. We also recently amalgamated our corporation with uh, Galway area, and we've now in, renamed our corporation to Crystal Lake Community Association. Next, if I still have a moment. Um, just a quick, the mayor gave me the, um, the end of time. Okay, thank you. I was I was warned to keep this on um, on, on time, and that gives uh, that gives everybody quite uh, opportunities for questions too. 
Um, Do you have any questions, questions then? I'd like to, any questions from anybody? You can see the, um, thank you. Okay. Oh, I was just gonna say, you can see where we've made some donations. A lot of a lot of fundraising this year and a lot of community outreach. No, I think you I think you've done uh, I think you've done well and I love your gardens. Uh, anybody else with do you want to sure. Um thank you for your governor. Um thanks, Christine. I know you've got a very active group up there and, and congratulations for staying engaged with them. I did have one question. I started to read the uh, pre-read for your AGM. And even though your Facebook site has over a thousand members, which is amazing and it's very active, you only have 235 paid members. And I wondered what your what your thoughts about that were and if you had a strategy to kind of increase that, as we all do, to try and increase our membership. Yeah, well, thank okay. Thank you on that. Um the actual the very easy answer to that is that there are multiple household members that are Facebook members. So 235 actually is a very, uh, when you look at the population of Crystal Lake, as far as uh, property ownership, we have a very high percentage of membership versus other lake associations. And so we're very um, proud of our membership because you can easily see if you go in, you can have three, four, five uh, family members that are a member of Facebook. And we also do have, um, the like because we're called the Galway area we have more than just Crystal Lake as members and we do so we we've got a uh, we we went from 180 members two years ago to 235 in 2020 which is a huge increase and we are trending upwards already for 2021. Great thank you. Okay thank you. um just as um uh, just as a, a an add-on or maybe and an, maybe uh, an, I think the agenda being posted as well as far ahead as it is and as uh, in detail as it is I think for people who are wondering about what's coming up I think for people who follow that agenda you can pretty well know what the hot tops are going to be um, anytime that we've got notice of motion those are always uh, those are always promoted now and uh, the fact that the uh, the zoom although it's a pain in the backside for a lot of us it has certainly given much better access to the public in general. So I think some of your concerns about the um, uh, communication have been have been solved uh, mainly because of this pandemic. So I don't know what everybody else feels about that, but uh, to me, I think it's a, it's a positive. It's a positive and a negative. Anyone else if a I, question? Uh, if I may. I was just going to do a follow up on that, um, and that is that I do appreciate that the website has been um, upgraded and it's new, but I have to admit, as others, that it is a bit awkward to drill down to read uh, the agendas and the topics for for council meetings. Yes, yes, thank and you. I do always send out an email in advance of the meeting. Um, usually a week, sometimes only a day, <laughs> to the ratepayers associations, in, including yours, Christine, um, and just pulling out four or five topics, which I think will be of interest to local residents, as well as a link to the agenda and a link to the, the meeting. So I have taken on myself to proactively push that information out. So I think that should help anybody who, uh, if you're redistributing that, I think that should be a, a, a wide, uh, way to get the information out about what topics will be coming up. Okay, thank you. Ron, do you have any comments or? No, I just want to thank Peter very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Christine. Thank you. Our next uh, delegation is Gary Jarrells, and again, uh, ten minutes, please. Good morning, everybody. Madam Mayor, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor and Councillor Franson, Councillor Armstrong, thank you for your time and thank you to Donna, Jesse and the rest of the staff who put this meeting together. Um, just echoing some of the other comments that the associations really are the ambassadors for the municipality in terms of communication to your constituents. Um, you know, people work for a living, even the retirees don't have the time 
uh, to go to the website and get all the information. And we appreciate what you do, Councillor Armstrong. It would be really nice to get a reader's digest of what comes out of each of the council meetings. I know it's extra staff work, but that really would be useful because I know what Councillor Armstrong sends out says, here's kind of the interesting topics, but either you got to attend the meeting or you have to go get the minutes to, uh, uh, to understand what came out of that. So I think that's where Christine was heading in terms of communicating with the associations. Anyway, a couple things that the Cavendish Community Ratepayers Association wanted to uh, bring forward just in terms of information and where we were having some concerns about what was happening, uh, specifically first for the transfer hour changes. Um, you know, we understand certainly in the winter time, I don't think that's really an issue. It's a health and safety thing in terms of uh, daylight. We get into uh, daylight issues. But during the summer, uh, turning the hours back um, on Sunday night appears to be problematic from what we're getting from our uh, community. I mean, there's a, a lot of seasonal residents. Let's look at it. It's about 85% are seasonal residents. A lot of people have dinner um, after enjoying the day and then on their way out, they go by the transfer site, get rid of their garbage and head back to the city. Uh, some people have resorted to taking their garbage back to the city, uh, but the vast majority like to use the service. And so again, uh, we know it's all wrong, but we know we hear from constituents a lot that the only service they get is the transfer sites. And we know that's wrong and we continue to educate them on that. So if all of a sudden that changes, um, that's going to be a perceived service that is being reduced. So um, something to consider. I think we really need to get some fact-based data. So I'm glad this motion was deferred. As you know, we put forward to defer it. Let's get some fact-based data. Let's get some public input on it. And the associations are more than happy to help you get that information. Um, it would be good to get an update on the uh, master facilities plan or the facilities master plan. Uh, we know during the uh, committee groups, that you included the associations. Uh, we work with Donna and some of the other council and staff on, and we've moved to the combined Roadworks Depot fire uh, facilities. Uh, I'd like to get an update on where those are and what the timing is. I know there were still some questions as it related to what was happening up in the Galway Kim Mount area. So it would be nice to know what's going on there to keep everybody up to date, uh, which obviously leads us on to the next item, which is the dedicated mechanics facility. And what we're hoping is this isn't uh, back to the future. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. biggest issues we had was that project went from a mere two and a half million dollar plan to a five million to a seven million to you know potentially even 12 million. And now when we rejigged it back to shared facilities, we scaled that back um, because that is a huge capital investment. But now it looks like it's resurfacing to be a major expense. And maybe as part of the consultant report, we got to maybe relook at it uh, to one of the original recommendations we said, which was, do you really need a, a dedicated mechanics facility for two mechanics? I mean, that's what we have, two mechanics. Um, or maybe we have them travel around to the different depots. And maybe that's a good way to save three or $4 million. Uh, so we, I think we really got to consider that. But I do want to thank council for pushing uh, on the idea of shared facilities. There's no reason why Parks and Rec couldn't be combined into a roadworks depot. Absolutely a great idea. So thanks for that. Uh, so um, in terms of the um, short-term rentals, um, I know Christine already addressed it, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. Please, again, as we restart that, include the association groups. Let's get feedback from the constituents. I think it's very important. A lot of people, retirees, depend on rental income, uh, but there are, as we always know, a few bad apples that ruin it for everybody, and that's what we want to control, but we just got to make sure that we don't make it overly cumbersome for the property owners that occasionally rent their property. So all I, our, our recommendation there is please uh, include the associations again, because we were active in the last one and I think we, we can add a lot of value again. And also I think going a year later, we'll be able to see what some other municipalities are doing. Um, last issue, and we've brought this up before, is bylaw enforcement. Um, having the nighttime call-in number and the weekend call-in number is great, uh, but it is not meeting the requirements. We really need to have bylaw enforcement personnel in the evenings and on the weekends. Classic example is on the Victoria Day long weekend. 
Um, email came out about fireworks. This is a fireworks bylaw not allowed on this weekend. Uh, we sent it out to our association. I know many of the other associations did. There were a large number of firework displays on that weekend. In fact, there was a fireworks sale depot at a Flynn's Corner. So, you know, we kind of need to really figure out how we put our arms around this issue. It, the phone in line is great. Unfortunately, by the time anyone acts on it, the weekend's over, the people are gone, the offenders are gone, the issues happened. And uh, we really need to relook at that. And if that means taking budget money from a different area so that we can pay for personnel, then maybe we scale down the dedicated mechanics facility by a million bucks. And we've got probably 10 years worth of by law enforcement. So something needs to be done. And I think it's beyond um, where we're at today. I think we really got to get a working group to look at it because it's certainly not meeting the requirements right now. We're hearing a lot more complaints. In fact, fireworks have been going off for the last few months, never mind the Victoria Day long weekend. Um, other than that, I'm very happy that you had the Court uh, Stewards, uh, Lake Stewards Association on. As you know, the Cavendish Community Rate Payers Association very much aligned with what they're doing. We ran the Love Your Lake program. We did the Shoreline Naturalization program. We've continued on with Paul Frost um, at Trent University in terms of the uh, lake uh, water quality uh, testing and we're doing deep lake water quality testing so that we can get uh, years and trending data. Um, we'd be more than happy to share that with the municipality. Uh, we'd also like to get the municipality to, to support us in those efforts because there is costs associated with the water testing. But I think it is critical um, to, as uh, you know, Councillor Armstrong said, the lakes are our asset. That's what makes our community. And uh, we, we would like to have the town, the municipality supporting us in that effort too. And that's all we really had. Um, any questions from anybody on uh, council? I'd be more than happy to answer them. Okay, I'm looking for hands. I just wanna thank you, Gary. I've, I have a comment, Gary. I would, uh, I'm to the point where I think we should just have a fire, uh, fireworks ban. Global warming is making our, our uh, forests just like tinder. And we can no longer take, uh, take chances on the way people uh, use these things. So giving people certain weekends and whatever just isn't working because they consider every weekend to be a holiday. And every, every corner is selling them. It's no longer the small one. They're selling these big outfits. So I, I share your concern where that's concerned. Uh, anybody else with uh, comments? Yes. Thank you, uh, three Madam Mayor. Maybe just a plug, and maybe you, Gary, you want to make it, but I know that you've got a couple of meetings coming up this summer with some um, excellent speakers coming in, uh, including one who's going to talk a little bit more about the uh, cell gap project as well as the, the broadband gap project for internet. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you'll let people know when those are coming up so they can uh, either listen in or listen to the recordings. Yes, and we, uh, as you know, we, we do do a fair amount of advertising for that meeting, and you're right, Councillor Armstrong, we do have the people from EORN coming in, and um, there is a significant investment that has happened or been committed to over the last uh, 12 months, and that's what we want to get an update on, because during COVID, we have had a lot of seasonal residents come up here, and they've literally been here since the wintertime uh, working from home, and uh, having good broadband and internet capability is critical for that. And it's also critical to the township from the standpoint of economic development. And if I may add one other plug is as a community, um, I know we, we have an economic development committee and I know we have some staff dedicated to it, but um, you know, having worked with some of the other smaller regions and, and cities um, in Toronto, like Durham region in specific, um, we should really make some consideration for having a full-time economic development officer in Trent Lakes. Um, because if we're not looking 10 years down the road at what we need to do from an economic development standpoint, we will be chasing how to increase our tax base and pay our bills because people are not gonna be attracted here if we don't have the kind of economic development we have. And while we have a great group of volunteers and staff people working on it, I really think it's time for us to step forward 
and and hire a, a full-time economic development officer um, and and really uh, put some efforts into it because we have a lot going for us. There's a lot going on. What we don't want to do is miss the boat and have everybody end up in Lindsay or, or Peterborough versus in Trent Lakes. Uh, Peter. I, I, I have a, a comment and kind of a question, Gary. It, it's about the long-term rentals. It's not just a few bad, bad apples. I'm getting calls on a weekly basis about uh, uh, neighbors that are renting their places out and people are considering selling because they can no longer enjoy the waterfront properties. Uh, with Buckhorn Lake Estates, where there's four or five uh, uh, rentals and uh, they're on a water system and they're worried about the impact to their water system when there is uh, 16 to 20 people sharing one cottage. So I think it's a really, really major problem. I don't disagree with you, Peter. And, and that's why I think hand in hand is this bylaw enforcement because those a lot of those rentals are happening on weekends some of them do happen during the week but a lot of them happen on weekends and that's when most of the noise and the extra extra people are and unfortunately the only option people have is to phone the opp and we know that's a tough grind to try and get people out for that but if we had municipal uh, bylaw enforcement people who were available on weekends or in evenings, we could address a lot of that. And that's why we believe we need to take the next step in terms of bylaw enforcement. The phone in line is great, but unfortunately, you know, that's like calling 911 and then the ambulance doesn't show up, you know, so. I, I agree with you. Okay, um, if we don't have any more questions, we will thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Now we have Warren Dunlop, please, representing North Pigeon Lake Association. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is uh, Warren Dunlop and I'm the current president of the North Pigeon Lake Association. And I'm uh, happy to present on behalf of the board of directors of the NPLA uh, today. So I don't have a fancy, uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation this morning, but I'd just like to uh, focus on a, uh, one one key area uh, that we are, our association is interested in, and that's uh, environmental protection. So uh, your your worship, councillors and staff, uh, I'd like to thank you first of all for uh, arranging this special council meeting to facilitate communication with ratepayers and cottage associations during these challenging times. As uh, our other presenters have mentioned, that we know it's a lot of work uh, to do these kind of things, and uh, happy that uh, uh, that you're continuing to try and improve communication uh, with uh, uh, the various associations. So thank you again. Um, first, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the Treaty 20 Mississaugic Territory, and in the traditional territory of the Mississaugic and Chippewa Nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, and Georgina Island First Nations. The North Pigeon Lake Association respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. The NPLA supports these stewardship efforts by, as stated in our constitution, striving to preserve and promote the welfare of the shoreline and the waters of North Pigeon Lake and its catchment area. In the late 1980s, a group of engaged seasonal and permanent shoreline residents came together to form the North Pigeon Lake Ratepayers Association. This, is so, this action was in response to concerns about the environmental impacts of a planned marina expansion associated with the proposed development of Big or Boyd Island. In recent years, the association was renamed North Pigeon Lake Association and now includes members on Bass Lake, Nogis Creek, and throughout the greater North Pigeon Lake watershed. The objectives of the group haven't changed, however. Protection of the local environment and promotion of sustainable development continue to be the main focus of our organization. One way the NPLA supports environmental protection is by monitoring the health of the lake and watershed through collecting water samples for nutrient analysis as part of the Federation of Ontario Cottage Associations and Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks Lake Partner Program, 
as well as for the Kawartha Lake Stewards Association's E. coli testing program, uh, both programs of which Ed Leardham uh, gave you a little overview earlier today. In 2015, under the leadership of the Kawartha Land Trust, the NPLA joined with other associations and the broader Trent Lakes and Bob Cajun communities to raise $1 million for an endowment fund through an effective public fundraising campaign. This helped to secure the donation of the Big Island, now the Big Boyd Chiminess Island property, which is owned by Court Land Trust, uh, for protection in perpetuity and thus fulfilled the dreams of the charter members of the NPLRA. The municipality of Trent Lakes and Curve Lake First Nation were a big part of that coalition, providing both support to the project team and financial contributions to the endowment fund. This was a great example of a partnership that helped achieve the shared goal of preserving an important natural heritage feature that also provides recreational opportunities in our community. NPA, MPLA continues to support the Kawartha Land Trust financially and as volunteers. Another example of a successful partnership in this municipality is the co-management of the John Earl Chase Memorial Park at Gannon's Narrows by Parks Canada through the Trent Severn Waterway and the Kawartha Land Trust. The Buckhorn Trails Association and the Municipality of Trent Lakes provided early support to this initiative. The partnership has transformed a heritage property from one that had been ignored and abused for years into a de destination for hikers, dog walkers, and others who appreciate the natural environment. I've provided MPLA's background and the two partnership examples as an introduction to encouraging the municipality to continue to support efforts to protect our natural environment and thus provide the basis for a strong economy. Collectively, we can achieve much more than we can individually. Specifically, the NPLA has reviewed the Parks Recreation and Culture Master Plan, which was recently delivered to Council. In it, we recognize many themes that align with the history and objectives of our organization and the recent successful partnerships to preserve local natural areas. First, we'd like to congratulate the municipal staff and the Parks, Recreation and Culture Advisory Committee on the consultation progress, uh, sorry, process to get public input to develop the master plan and thus reflect the priorities of the community. We appreciate being involved in the process and the efforts that were expended to reflect the views of both permanent and seasonal residents. We are very supportive of the open space recommendations. Improved boat ramps, a trail network, repurposing existing parks and developing new parks would all be welcomed by permanent and seasonal residents alike. These initiatives would no doubt prove beneficial in bringing visitors to the area. In addition to considering vacant municipal land for potential new parks, we would encourage the municipality to explore the possibility of securing new natural environment properties through purchase. While this is a more expensive option, working with appropriate partners could help reduce the financial burden on the municipality and taxpayers. Any potential securements could also be looked at in the context of supporting the proposed trail network. NPLA also sees the policy recommendations as fundamental in supporting the open space recommendations. Strong partnership, engaged volunteers, and effective communications were all components of the successful stewardship examples I presented earlier and would be essential for successfully implementing any work plans that are developed to support the master plan. While the facilities programming and services theme is perhaps slightly less aligned with MPLA objectives, we see the value in implementing these recommendations as they reflect the public input received during development of the plan. In particular, we support the development of a heritage plan in order to preserve and educate the community about our shared heritage. In conclusion, we hope the Parks Recreation and Culture Master Plan will be a living document and will help the community meet its strategic objectives. We look forward to realizing the stated vision for the master plan, connected and accessible recreational, cultural and parkland experiences in sustainable natural environments that enable healthy, active living for all. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have questions for this gentleman? I have, I have one, and that is when looking at parkland, to make sure that adequate parking is provided. You, uh, you mentioned the Chase Park, and that is a nightmare over there for people who live there because of the people who are parking, trying to, trying to access that park. I don't know, there's some acres there and there's seven parking places. 
So from the campground all the way to the bridge at Gannon's Narrows, the public are parked on both sides of that bridge on the weekend. So going forward, um, it's not like a park in the city where people can take a bus to get to it or whatever. The people who you are parked drive to the parks. So it's a, it's a problem. Um, that would be the one thing that I would, that comes to mind as far as I'm concerned right now. Has anybody else got anything else they want to add to this presentation? Uh, we, uh, could I make a comment uh, on your comment, uh, Your Worship? Sure. Um, yeah, I've, 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 I've spent a number of visits to to the John Earl Chase property, and that, as you know, that uh, there were concerns about uh, access there, and the parking lot was upgraded uh, through some money from I think the municipality contributed, but also Parks Canada to upgrade that parking lot. And any time I've been there, I think the, the users I've observed have been using the parking lot. And there is a concern with uh, people along the road, but I think those people are uh, folks that are fishing on the causeway at the bridge and they're parking near, there's a little pull off at the intersection there where the, the mailboxes are. And from my observation, um, the folks that are parking along the road there are the ones that are coming to fish uh, at the Narrows. I think it's I think it's both. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Now, did I hear that there's another interaction uh, questioning being done, or is this the end of the presentation? So yes, through you, yes, that's been done. So that would be the end. So this is the end. Yes. Okay. Since I came in late. Not that I intended to come in late, but we have new uh, we have new phones, and somewhere along the line, the app in my phone is not apt to do this. So I apologize for being late. Um, I'm going to just give you a little bit of a, an update as far as the county is concerned. We've got um, pressures in here on cost savings, and one of the things that we've been working with, and our CAO has been involved in this as well, is we're trying to figure out ways to streamline. Uh, especially the um, planning end of it, so that we're not duplicating so many steps between the townships and the county. Uh, we've had so far, we've had some builders involved in it, and uh, at one time there was a, a big pushback from the county because they obviously they wanted to protect their uh, uh, their uh, staff. But right now everybody is understaffed, so people are are more apt to uh, to take a look at where we where we can streamline. So that's one thing that's coming down as far as the, as the county is concerned. Uh, there's a big delegation going forward. Uh, we were going to do it with AMO, but there's actually a whole lot of people involved in this to try to come to some agreement with the uh, with the government to uh, step into the. And Donna, you can make, you can say this because I never do it right. It's the last. Let's see, insurance, the last of whatever. Joint and several liability. Joint and several liability, because it is costing all of us, even if it isn't a, an actual lawsuit that we have involved in it, the premiums that we're all paying is re, is respected is is reflected because of that. The council, the county, I can't tell you how many millions of dollars right now are in are in lawsuits. What that actually means is any time that the that the uh, township or the municipality is involved in anything whether they're actually involved or not, everybody sees them as, as deep pockets and they end up being tacked onto the end of a lawsuit. So there is a, there's an understanding that, uh, that this has got to change. It's based on an American system. And if it doesn't, if we don't get some sort of, of um, solution to this, it's going to get to the part that most municipalities are not going to be being able to offer some of the services that we take for granted because we're not going to be able to afford those premiums. So it is being looked at. Uh, we're also uh, looking seriously at the gypsy moth uh, problem. I'm getting calls daily. I know mm -hmm. the rest of council's getting calls daily on this. We're being told that the government understands that it is an invasive species, but on a very limited basis, do they want to take any responsibility? So the last that I've heard is any applications we make have to be done in January. So again, we've got a delegation going to AMO to try to um, get them to take a look at how bad this situation is and get the program started. Because in, uh, in January, you certainly have no idea as to what's going on. 
And unlike the tent caterpillar, these little beggars don't seem to want to cycle. They just get worse and worse and worse. And as far as telling the individual landowners at $300, $350 an acre plus, you can't control these little fellows like that because they, they let themselves down on a little piece of silk, which is why they were brought here in the first place. The wind picks them up and you take them off. So you may spend the time um, spraying your own yard only to find out that they've moved on. You've got them from somewhere else. So anyway, I think right now, I don't know what the rest of, of council is saying, but I'm probably getting more calls right now on the gypsy moth than, than, uh, than anything else. Um, on the t on um, rentals, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest problems that we've got with the rentals is that there's been no, um, the, the stay at home order has not been abided by by anybody. So the, the businesses have had to take extreme precautions and whatever, most of them, this weekend is the first that any of the businesses have opened up to any extent, 14th is when they're coming. But the, uh, the Lakeshore properties have been going strong for the last year and a half or so. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's um, to me, it's a very sad situation because the average visitor, cottager, resident, whatever you whatever term you want to use and i know there's a lot of people who still like that term cottage because it represents family and whatever i i find it to be a very uh i like i like the term and the average person who comes here is extremely welcome i don't get calls from people talking about their their neighbors or whatever they don't they don't abuse they come with whatever they need for a weekend they stay they do whatever they're going to do so the average person who comes here as a seasonal resident, I have nothing but, but praise for the way that they've handled things, but we have a lot of abuse. Anybody care to add anything to that? Yes, Peter. Uh, most of the calls I'm receiving are from people complaining about uh, uh, short-term rentals. And there's people that are, are actually selling their their homes because they can no longer enjoy them. And it's driving the real estate costs tremendously. Okay, um, unless somebody else has something to want to add to this, I'd like to get a motion to receive the delegations. And, and Janet, I think- all Sorry, Janet. Yeah. Janet, hey, it's Gary Juros from the Cavendish Community Ratepayers Association. One last thing that I just wanted to update council and staff on and also to extend our thanks for your support, is that as you know, the Kachikoma Forest, there's been a lot of work going on logging and we had a couple of special interest groups uh, looking at it as an old growth forest and they um, came to the uh, municipality for support. I know Councillor Armstrong worked with the rest of uh, council and staff to get a support letter. We also did it with the Cavendish Community Ratepayers and we haven't got all the details, but we know that they are going to stop logging in uh, those that area for about a year, um, so that additional research can be done on the old growth forest. So, wanted to thank uh, council and staff for their support and for all the good work done by the Kachikoma uh, Forest uh, Committee uh, Stewardship Committee (CFSC). So, just wanted to give you an update on that, and and probably the CFSC will be providing more details on that. But thanks again for your support. Well, and I think that that brings up another another um, statement I was going to put in here. That another problem with the gypsy moth, if they come into an area for the second year, in in a lot of cases they're going to they're going to kill the first year. They'll strip if there's enough moisture in the ground. They tend to refoliate the second year. You're going to lose them. So in the areas like you're speaking of, where where the ground has gotten drier and drier and drier, all of these trees that are dead. Are going to be just sitting there just waiting for a forest fire so there's a lot of areas why we should be why we should be dealing with this so yes we should be protecting this old forest absolutely we don't have very much of it left but we need to protect them from these little from these little beggars thank you gary uh, thank you council thanks staff very much i know this has been a this has been a I wouldn't say a labor of love because right now with everybody being as busy as it is and i think we all look forward to being able to do go back to the round table like we had had structured a year ago where people have a have an opportunity to have a little bit more give and take but i think for this year this was as um as uh, as well as it could be done and i think we all are uh, we're pleased with the outcome 
So I will uh, take a, moat, um, a motion to approve all of our delegations. Thank yeah. you, uh, Ron, and seconded by um, Carol. And all in favor? And can we have a motion to adjourn, please? Councillor Franzen, yes. Thank you, Mayor Clarkson. There's also the adoption of the confirming bylaw. Okay, can we have that? Councillor Carroll? I can't <laughs> That works. Deputy Mayor Windover, all in favor? Carried. Now, shall we uh, adjourn? Adjourn? Shall we adjourn now? <laughs> <laughs> Deputy Mayor Windover, would like to adjourn. Seconded, please. <laughs> Councillor Franzen, all in favor? Thank you very much. <laughs>